and better. So thank you for coming, um, and thank you to the last speaker. It's uh, kind of interesting to be giving a talk after such a good talk and with a lot of stuff to comment on. Um, I'll try to refrain from that and keep to my own agenda. Um, this talk is uh, betting the company on Clojure. Uh, Clojure is a programming language that you might have heard of. Uh, the premise for the talk is that on a lot of conferences like this, there's people coming and presenting new tech, and they're saying like, hey, we got this thing called Flex. You should really try it. It's really great, and it's going to work super well. Uh, you have Java server faces. It's super nice. It's going to revolutionize everything. But that's really easy to say as the tech emerges. Um, but you have very few sort of retrospective talks. That's my son calling. Um, you have very little retrospective talks where, like for, uh, for this example, we're talking about an experience of using Clojure um, that was a fairly new tech at the time um, with a 10 years, almost 10 years retrospective. So we can now look back and we can see, did this work or did it not work? Obviously, since I'm here talking about it and RDoc still exists, it didn't fail miserably. So the agenda for today is basically setting the stage. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about um, what to consider when choosing the tech to, uh, for, your, uh, for your company. Talk about hiring, and of course, it wasn't all sunshine, so we'll look at some of the technology choices that we made were that were not great. Um, and then we'll do a little summary at the end. So um, setting the stage. Uh, Ardoc was founded in 2013 by Magnus Pilskog and Eric Buckstad. And the premise for the company as such was that Magnus was working as a consultant, I think it was at DNB, and he was tasked with sort of mapping out the architecture of DNB. So basically in Visio or some other tool like that, he was sitting and drawing like this system talks to that system, which is supported by these servers and blah, blah, blah. Um, and every time he sort of came up with a design of this is how everything works at DNB, uh, someone raised their hand and said, well, did you really talk to the guy down the hall there about this other system that nobody uses anymore but still is important to us? And then so we had to go in and fix his Visio drawings and update them, and this happened all the time. So he was thinking, if I could just um, sort of gather this as data and then generate uh, visualizations based on that data, then I wouldn't have to redraw this in, uh, in Visio uh, all the time. Uh, I joined uh, Clojure, uh, sorry, Ardoc in 2017, much because of, not because I was sort of interested in the domain, but uh, they had this enticing uh, programming language that I was very fond of. Uh, today we're about, so we're approaching 200 uh, employees, um, and our engineering team is about 42, including QA, um, and interns, and we're about 16 people uh, programming in Clojure. Uh, our front end is in JavaScript and the back end is in Clojure. And when I say JavaScript in this talk, I will be meaning JavaScript slash TypeScript. Um, enterprise architecture, you say. Um, what is that? Because uh, that's the domain that Ardoc is in. And basically, it is mapping out the architecture of the enterprise, which means all the things that you would do for your code, looking at coupling, cohesion, uh, cyclic namespaces, and all that kind of thing, but for, um, but for the organization. Um, Ardoc consists now of about 120-ish uh, lines of code, of back-end code closure, and uh, somewhere around 400,000 lines of JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, so it's a front-end heavy app, definitely. Uh, myself, I'm a software dev. Um, I carry many hats at Ardoc, but I consider myself first and foremost a dev. Um, I've been programming for more than 25 years. Started out... Um, with a language called AUK uh, at uh, Statistisk Centralbüro here in uh, Oslo. Um, then I transitioned over to Perl, which I was really happy with. Uh, some people are not. Um, and then Java, which I was not very happy with, but some people are. Uh, JavaScript and then Clojure. Clojure is where I found Clojure, um, and I did that about in 2014 when I was allowed to sort of take on my own project uh, inside a company and I was able to choose tech. Um, at that point in time, I was sort of very into uh, functional programming, figuring out what that was. And I'd been looking at Scala, and I'd been looking at Clojure, and it was sort of 50-50, but the reason I chose Clojure at that time was that Scala had a lot more syntax. There's a lot more stuff to learn with Scala. Uh, Clojure is just parentheses, so it's um, a lot easier. 
Uh, I also run this uh, sort of run this project called CLJ Commons, which is um, a home for useful but uh, non-maintained libraries in the Clojure ecosystem. So um, unlike perhaps in Java and the .NET world, uh, libraries are made by uh, people like us, um, not by organizations, and sometimes people move on. But that doesn't mean that their library is not uh, relevant anymore. Um, and maybe even the library is done and they're done with maintaining it. But what we do at CLJ Commons is that we uh, create sort of life support for them so that when there's a CVE in an underlying library, uh, we patch and we, uh, we fix like small bugs, but we don't do active development on them anymore. It's, I think, a good uh, idea for many ecosystems because there's a lot of abandoned stuff out there that uh, is useful. So 2013, what did that look like? Um, that's when Arduk was started. Um, a quick search, search shows that that was when uh, Lance Armstrong admitted to uh, doping in uh, Tour de France. It's when uh, Magnus Carlsen, somewhat in the news today, or these days, uh, became world champion for the first time. And it was around that time when I started dabbling into functional programming. I discovered Map and Filter, um, and I was struggling with Reduce because that was sort of like hard and stuff. Um, and I really wanted to programming anything than, uh, than Java and JavaScript. Um, and a lot of other people were sort of in that same mindset at that point in time. Um, uh, but the thing that really got me uh, onto Clojure, apart from the lack of syntax, was that uh, a Norwegian developer called Bodil Stokke had a uh, talk at Øredev, where she um, basically programmed a full CRUD app um, in less than 100 lines of Clojure, including uh, uh, the UI and database access and everything. And at that point in time, with the Java I was working with, that would not have been possible in less than 1,000 lines. So it was like... I can do my work in like 10 times less code. Uh, that's like super. Um, <coughs> so what's Java? Um, this is a blog post by a guy named Jamie Zavinsky, who you might have heard of. Uh, he's the one that sort of gave us, uh, in so many ways, uh, Netscape Navigator and then Mozilla. And then based off that Firefox, he open sourced Netscape Navigator. and. He then went on to run a nightclub somewhere in San Francisco. But his main point is that um, this stuff at the bottom here, that when we talk about Java, and I think that's relevant also for uh, C Sharp, but it's not as obvious, or we're, we don't mix it that much with C Sharp, but Java is a language which you may or may not enjoy. It's an enormous class library, which is really useful when you want to get stuff done. Uh, it's a virtual machine, which is one of the best things we ever constructed with software. Um, and it's a security model, which we don't talk much about uh, today. So um, this is a little bit important going forward, that we remember that Java are these four things, and not just like a language that you compile and run somewhere. Clojure uh, is a hosted language which runs on the JVM, so it runs on a part of what we consider to be Java. It's very expressive, it's data-oriented, it has a very well-designed core library, and it has a small and friendly uh, developer community, which means that you need help. Uh, it's really easy to reach out to people, and if you want to get involved in the Clojure community, it's much easier, I find, than sort of in the Java community, which is more enterprisey and it's harder to get on the committees of people deciding where things are going. Um, much easier to be influential in a small and friendly community. JavaScript, which we also use, uh, is a <laughs> fairly nicely designed language considering that it was implemented in 10 days. Uh, it's a great compilation target, so ClojureScript, a dialect of Clojure, uh, compiles down to uh, JavaScript so you can use it in, uh, in the browser. And it has some good parts, and it evolves really quickly. Uh, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript with gradual typing. It's got a nice dev environment. Uh, it's getting to be where ClojureScript was in uh, 2014 or 15 when FigWheel, like this hot code reloading stuff, uh, came about. Um, and of course, me being a dynamic typer myself, if it weren't for the types, it would be really, really nice. So um, when you choose tech, um, please consider ideas over implementations. So if you look at some new shiny tech, look at what kind of ideas uh, that tech brings to the table. Don't look so much at the, don't get enthused by the implementation. Think about how you can take those ideas 
and put them into your own um, tech that you have. Look at what the problems that tech was meant to solve. Do you have these problems? Um, when you're starting a company, you need to be able to start to move fast. So you need to be able to make many small experiments and uh, you don't necessarily know what you'll end up making. This is a good story for dynamic typing because if you're sort of cementing your approaches in, uh, in static types, it's much harder to change it afterwards. Also, look for tech that gives you leverage. Um, leverage means access to a lot of pre-made stuff. It also means uh, writing less code to achieve the same thing because if you have if you can write less code, then you need less developers, and as we will see, uh, developers are sometimes hard to find. Prepare for success. Most of us, when we think about preparing for success, we think about you have to scale out Kubernetes everything and you know uh, Elastic everything. But the thing is that success looks like normally um, you can run your co company on your iPhone, but the problem is when you need to have more devs working for you. Um, you need to uh, get those devs, you need to find them, you need to make them want to work with you, and you also need to make them want to work uh, together and be able to work together on your code base. And think about what happens when you go from 1,000 lines to 100,000 100, lines of code. Um, that is what you need to prepare for. Um, you need to hedge. Um, what if your tech bet fails, like uh, if you bet your company on Flex or JSF? Um, what, how, what happens when you grow? Um, make sure that you can swap out parts of your stack uh, without having to change all of it. Um, and please do keep your business logic um, separate from all the rest of the plumbing stuff so that you can change the plumbing and keep your business logic. Hiring. So um, the traditional premise for hiring is flawed. Um, normally you think like everything hiring is built on the fact or on the assumption that there is an abundance of qualified candidates and that your job is to choose the best. But in reality, uh, you're lucky if you can reach the candidates that you want. Uh, and once you have a candidate that's somewhat qualified, your job is to sell the company to that com uh, candidate so that he will be interested in joining. Um, yeah. And in 2013, in this, uh, at Ushul Spectrum here, uh, my former boss, uh, Simon Jurgensen, uh, held a talk called The Economies of Scala. And Basically, his, um, his premise was that everyone is looking for devs and you need to differentiate. And what he found was that through some research, choosing niche languages gives you less competition. And if we look at uh, Finn for uh, this month, we see that we have like 140-ish Java positions open. We have 110-ish uh, JavaScript positions open. Um, and then we're going down to Scala, Clojure, and Haskell. And like, if you're into um, if you're into Haskell, you know exactly where you should go and apply for for a job, right? That's that one company. But if you're uh, look, if you um, want to have a Java job, then uh, there's the the choice is so big. So it's really hard for the companies looking for Java devs to find the the devs that they want. And there's also this thing about uh, which uh, Paul Graham calls the Python paradox. Um, using niche languages gives you smarter programmers. Uh, not to say that people programming Java or C Sharp are not smart, but um, the people who choose to program in niche languages, they actually go to an effort to learn these languages on their own. And so the language you should learn to get a job is not the language you learn to get a job. So in a way saying that um, the language you learn to get a job is Java, but the language you should learn to get a job is Haskell or Clojure. Uh, so learn the language that you want to work in and find, um, find the job that has that language. And for us at RDoc, this is sort of uh, kind of interesting because we see that um, in order to find one front-end candidate that we're willing to extend an offer to, we need to have 200 candidates. Whereas for the back-end position, we need less than 10. So also, in terms of hiring, it's so much easier to hire for closure devs because um, they see that we are a closure shop, so once we have a job offer uh, open, uh, they come to us. And they're generally, um, they seem to get through the um, hiring process easier than, uh, than the JavaScript devs. 
When hiring, look for asymmetric compensation. So that is compensation that, co that is more valuable to the uh, employee than it co is costly uh, to you as an employer. Um, so one such thing is to work with other good devs. That's what we like. Uh, we like to work with sharp tools. We like to work on interesting problems. And we like to work on beautiful tech. And there's a reason there's no beautiful American cars is that American managers don't know what beautiful is. So when you join a company, make sure that you join a company with a strong technical leadership that has the ability to see what a beautiful tech is. So um, all signs shine? Nope. Um, we chose Backbone and jQuery. Uh, not a good choice. We're paying for that still. We're constantly migrating off Backbone, and the code that's written with Backbone is not the most beautiful code we ever saw. MongoDB, uh, while it's a great choice uh, when you're starting because it lets you move really fast, uh, because it's dynamic, you can stick anything in a collection, uh, it's also really not so great when, um, when things grow because you don't know what's in your database. Anything can be in your database. And also, our data model is highly relational, so Postgres is a better, um, better fit for us. I'm running out of time, so I'll skip the story about the ugly woman in the cave, but um, the point being that these are just my observations. This is one data point. You could call it anecdata. Um, and I can't promise you that if you choose closure for your next startup that you will be successful. Uh, but there are some tips that might be wor worth um, pondering. So um, the tech that you choose is a strategic choice, so choose wisely. Um, don't get married to it. Make sure that you have a way out, should it be wrong. And uh, remember the economies of Scala and the Python paradox. Thank you.